very much for coming to tonight's um, uh, special discussion panel. I'm Liz Pelicano. I'm the, I run the Centre for Research in Autism and Education here at the Institute of Education. And we're delighted that you could all make it. Today's um, discussion is on making decisions shaping your lives, improving participation of autistic people and their families. So people should get a, a say in the decisions that affect their lives, at school, at home, in local communities. But some people often feel left out of those decisions. And even when they, when they are involved or they are included, they often feel that they're, they're not listened to or that they're, it's all just part of a big tick box exercise. So we, this, this particular discussion panel was inspired by um, a project we did, a future made together, which I don't have one in my hands, but I hope that you all have one in your hands so that you can take it home and read it. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, and, I mean, you'll hear more about that um, later on, but essentially we found that um, autistic people and their families felt that they, their voices were not heard. And this finding was particular in relation to autism research, but we suspect that this kind of goes across many aspects of people's lives. And this needs to change. So we, tonight we have a renowned set of speakers to debate and discuss the ways in which autistic people and their families might more fully participate in those decisions that shape their lives. We also have you. Um, so we want to know from you there's lots of time to discussion. So we want to know from you about your experiences of being involved or not being involved in those crucial decision-making processes. We want to know what kind of barriers there might be to participation. And we particularly want to know ways to overcome those barriers. Um, to enhance participation tonight, um, it's, it's Wi-Fi is abysmal down here, but I'm going to try to uh, live tweet on Twitter um, with the hashtag Cray discussion. Um, and we've also got a live webcast on our on the Cray YouTube channel, so um, which will be live, but you can also go home and watch it, and others will be able to watch it um, later on. So thank you all for coming. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Deepa Korea, who is the Chief Executive of Research Autism, um, and who so generously funded our Future Made Together project. So thank you, Deepa. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, the uh, format of the evening is that you're going to hear from uh, our panel of speakers. They're going to be speaking um, for about six or eight minutes. And then after they have spoken, uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions. We've left lots of time um, for you to, to be able to sort of ask your questions and we can have a, a full discussion. So if you can make a note uh, of your questions as a speaker, because we'll take all of the speakers in one block before the questions, then that would be very helpful indeed. Um, thanks, Liz, for organising this. I think it's a, it's, it's a really valuable um, uh, uh, event. Uh, we need to hear more for, uh, uh, autistic voices, I think, in, in the world of research. Um, and you know, we're all hugely committed to that. So without further ado, let me introduce my first speaker, um, who is Professor Tony Charman. Tony is the Chair of Clinical Child Psychology at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College. 
and is the founding director of Prey. So he's come home, haven't you, Tony? <laughs> um, his main research interest is the investigation of social cognitive development in children with autism and the clinical application of this work by a screening, diagnostic, epidemiological interve intervention outcome and at-risk studies. He's also a, the co-author of the study that uh, Liz talked about and which you all have a copy of called A Future Made Together. Um, and that's what he's going to talk to us about tonight. Do you need this? I do. I think I need to um, just. Liz, I'm just looking for. Just on the desktop. Are. Thank you, Deepa. Um, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to very briefly show you some of the findings from the um, report that uh, Liz has sort of mentioned that, um, um, that she and I and um, Adam um, um, uh, Dinsmore uh, co authored this year. And um, you have um, the summary version uh, in your hands if you haven't seen it. There are various websites, Research Autism, but also the Cray website where it can be um, downloaded. I'm not going to talk about the report in detail. It's an um, overview of research funding and asking questions about the current um, way that research is both funded and conducted in the UK that we think would be of interest to many people. But I'm going to just focus on one aspect um, of this report and the work that we did. So the work involved uh, an online survey completed by over 1,600 people, that's people with autism, family members, uh, professionals working um, with people with autism and um, researchers. Um, and um, a number of focus groups and interviews, again, with parents, with people with autism, with professionals, and with um, both junior and senior researchers. And as part of that, we asked people about um, their engagement um, uh, and their experiences of engagement in research. So we were interested in these two questions. How engaged does the community feel in research, and how engaged do researchers feel that they are with the community? And we talked about three different levels of engagement. And, um, they're up here on the um, slide. So one we've called dissemination. Uh, so that's um, researchers uh, sending inf information out about what they're doing or what they've done or what they've found. Two is dialogue. So different sort of um, uh, uh, forms in which one might discuss and, and communicate directly with community members. Uh, um, uh, um, so researchers and the autism communities we've chosen to call it um, speaking to each other. And the third is partnership that um, involves joint working um, um, so uh, with the autism community uh, in terms of uh, what questions are investigated, how they're investigated, how to understand what the findings are, and then disseminating um, uh, those findings. So in terms of um, involvement, the majority of researchers said that they frequently or very frequently engaged in public dissemination and dialogue. So um, us researchers gave ourselves a pretty good rating in terms of how good we were and how often we entered into dissemination and dialogue. But when we looked at the responses from many hundreds of people with autism, family members and practitioners, make up about 1,500 people of 16,000 plus who responded to the, so 1,600 plus who responded to the survey. Only a minority of people with autism, family members, and practitioners shared that view. So they didn't feel that even what you might see as the sort of um, uh, the, um, the, uh, easier forms of sort of engagement in terms of researchers being very good at disseminating their findings, telling the community what they're involved in, and speaking to them about it at events such as uh, uh, this evening's. Um, researchers felt they did quite a good job, um, but that wasn't uh, a view that was shared by the rest of the community. All the groups um, who responded um, agreed that active partnership was very rare. So no one thinks that much partnership working is going on within the autism field. And then these are just some uh, uh, quotes. People both online um, uh, could um, uh, write text. And obviously, the focus groups were recorded in, um, uh, in an anonymized way, which would report back what people said. And these are some of the perspectives from the researchers. Um, so say, 
the people making judgments about research and research funding have to be on scientists. So um, uh, um, the way that funding is allocated and decisions about what gets researched and who gets funded to research should be made by scientists only. Um, then talking about partnership, um, the, giving examples such as um, uh, members contributing feedback and being on steering groups as a way in which there was um, engagement with the autism community, but also some of the potential barriers. So these, uh, one researcher saying it can often be difficult to work with people with autism as their viewpoints may be held very firmly, and a black and white thinking style can be a challenge. Um, sometimes the most vocal individuals have a completely different experience or agenda. Um, then the community perspective, so here a parent saying, I have very little knowledge of any research that may be going on or what its purpose is, um, an autistic adult, so another parent saying researchers are more keen on collecting data and not providing results, an autistic adult, um, uh, um, and this is the title we've given to one of the papers that's now under review, sometimes we're a bit like monkeys in a zoo. Um, Barriers. Um, another parent, in my experience, researchers are only interested in helping those who are more able in the spectrum. These are obviously selective quotes from the you know, hundreds, uh, if not thousands, that we have available. Uh, another community perspective on priorities. A parent saying most UK researchers operate from ivory towers with very little contact with real autism. Um, a practitioner saying researchers are far too interested in causes and cures with um, intellectual understanding only and no practical application. Another practitioner um, saying, um, I don't think many researchers feel they can talk to autistic people as if they matter. They're too busy studying them like specimens or looking for a cure. So you know, one of the, we think, very rich sort of things that this um, um, exercise has allowed us to do is to sort of, uh, in, in a sense, see where the land lies in terms of the community partners in terms of um, engagement. And researchers feel they're doing an OK job at some things, but realize they're not doing um, perhaps you know, the, the most difficult things in terms of working in partnership. They feel they're doing some um, uh, dissemination. They feel there's some dialogue. That view is not shared by the rest of the autism community. But no one thinks it's very much um, uh, a partnership um, uh, um, in autism research here in the UK. Uh, it's also true, you can see from the individual quotes, that you know, there are a lot of people whose experience of, um, the, from the community of being engaged in research um, is not particularly positive. Um, so um, uh, just, just to sort of, um, um, one of the sort of challenges, and it's part of the reason for having this meeting along with other events that Liz and I and Research Ultras are involved in over the next sort of year, is that you know, clearly there's a problem and we need to find new ways of, of doing something about it. So this is the first um, event and it'll be a really useful way of trying to see what um, some of your ideas about both your experiences but also what the ways forward might be. Um, and here's a final um, quote from um, an adult with autism saying, whatever we say, is it really good to influence anyone? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, can you hear me if I don't have a microphone? Can you hear me at the back? Um, our next speaker is um, Charlotte Moore. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Charlotte. Um, many of you will know her from uh, her book, her fantastic book, uh, George and Sam, but also from The Guardian um, uh, films that she writes. So we're really pleased to, to have her here. A little bit about Charlotte is that she's the mother of the sorry, she's an author and has two sons with autism, George and Sam, who are now in their early twenties. Her memoir about autistic family life, entitled George and Sam, is an extraordinary book and a must read for anybody who works with or lives with autism. Um, it's recently been updated and reissued by Penguin and is on sale now. Uh, and I'm informed that it has some of the Guardian columns at the back, so you kind of get two for the price of one. So, Charlotte, over to you. Thank you very much. Is that working? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, uh, well, about ten years have passed since I wrote that book. Uh, my sons have turned from children into adults, and I think as a result, my attitude towards involving them with uh, research or indeed any kind of decision-making process has changed in that when they were children, I would cheerfully cart them off to this, that and the other, as indeed I did with my third uh, non-autistic son, Jake. Because when you have young children, you sort of feel in a way that you kind of own them and make all the decisions for them. 
But that situation has changed a lot now that George and Sam are both in their early 20s. Um, Sam is, uh, ha has language but doesn't use it very much, so is effectively non-verbal. Uh, George talks clearly and fluently, but in a very, very eccentric way. Um, and even though my job now as the mother of these young adults is to do my best to involve George and Sam in all decision-making processes that affect them, and yet there's obviously a huge challenge when you've got one young man who doesn't really talk at all and the other one uh, who is, his answers to questions are so off piste that it's very hard to find out uh, how much he's understood and what he really means. Um, for the last few years, uh, George has been religiously included in all his review meetings at school and college and so on. George has sat there, social worker, uh, careers officer, whatever, all these people, all there. Um, and George sits there and he's, you know, he's just thinking about the biscuits, really, I think. I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it's very hard to tell how much is going in. But they go through the motions and then, of course, there's always, now, George, have you any questions for us? Um, and George knows he needs to come up with a question, so he always says, have you got a pen? Uh, and then that's a question. It's a question that has an easy answer, and then George feels he's done what's expected of him. Um, similarly, uh, when people have asked George what he wants to do as an adult, what he wants to do in the future, George always says, um, I want to be a zookeeper. Um, I don't believe that George does want to be a zookeeper. I think he's plucked that phrase from a children's book about things you can do, jobs people do, you know, train driver, astronaut, zookeeper. And to him, it, again, it fits, you know, that this person who's asking him this question needs a response. George recognises the phrase, I want to be a, and he adds zookeeper. Heaven help us if George ever does get to uh, in charge of large, dangerous, uh, fierce animals. Uh, wouldn't be good for us or for them. Um, so I'm just saying that to highlight the difficulty of uh, having an autistic person taking part uh, in these decision-making processes. But of course, that does not mean it shouldn't happen. And I and the boys' other carers, the other people who are involved in their lives, we have to be enablers for them. We are physically enablers in that we um, take them to places uh, where they will um, enjoy themselves and lead healthy and fulfilled lives. Um, we also have to be, as it were, kind of intellectual enablers and we have to be um, interpreters because we know them uh, better than researchers or educationists or whatever. So we have to use our knowledge of them to uh, try and bridge, bridge that really rather wide um, gulf. And I would say that one problem I think there is with, with research, um, if you want to understand my sons, you can only do so through long and close and patient observation carried out over a considerable period of time. Now, most research, at least what the, the, that I've been involved in, is kind of, um, there's the child or, or the, the, the adult. Um, they're, they're, they're brought into a place. It's an unfamiliar place. They're sat down. They, uh, some tasks are put before them. Um, and then that's it. And to me, I, the, the value of that seems to be potentially quite limited. Um, if a researcher was to study George and Sam in their, as it were, their natural environment, I think they would find some much more interesting material. Um, I do remember what, taking part with them in one particular research project in Cambridge when they, they were meant to have their brains scanned. And, you know, this involved lying down on a sort of flat thing and being fed into a tunnel. And um, the minute we arrived, I thought, oh, this is not going to happen. Um, and sure enough, no amount of, of jelly beans and, and crisps and whatever could induce them to lie flat, be fed into this tunnel thing over their head, and, and then even if they had got into the tunnel, they, would, they couldn't possibly have followed the sequence of instructions to press the relevant 
switches that they were meant to do. So it was a complete waste of, of, of our time. It was a, a, probably a waste of a lot of public money in taking them to this place. Um, and it made me think that quite possibly that kind of research is heavily skewed towards the, very, the much more able end of the spectrum where you've got somebody who is able and willing to cooperate. Uh, but as far as George and Sam are concerned, um, it was just a kind of rather weird day out. Um, so, um, endless problems involving any kind of uh, communication, because after all, autism is a communication disorder, um, doesn't mean we shouldn't go on trying. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> That's it, really. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Charlotte. And our next speaker is Peter Beresford. Uh, Peter is Professor of Social Policy at Brunel University, and he's also the Director of the Centre for Citizen Participation. His particular areas of focus are public patient and service user involvement in policy and practice, uh, democratisation and participatory approaches to research, and particularly in relation to user-controlled and user-involved research. He has long-standing involvement in issues of participation and service user involvement in research and evaluation as a writer, a researcher, and an educator. And he also regularly writes for the Guardian on these issues. So over to you. Well, that sounds awfully boring. Can, <laughs> can people hear all right? Yes. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I was very pleased to read the report, which I thought was beautifully designed. Uh, I, I love the colours. and. Um, I had the sense of it representing a step forward uh, for discussion around both research in this context and also action that can follow it. And I want to say something about me in a different way to what you've just heard, that my background is critically as someone with long-term experience of using mental health services and working in a university as a researcher and as an educator, which is a terrific privilege. And it's great to combine those aspects of identity. Um, also someone who's involved in a national user-controlled organization called Shaping Our Lives. Please do Google us and download some of our loads of free publications written by service users. Uh, I think it's exciting that there is now a kind of official uh, blessing and recognition of the value of involvement in research for all constituencies that relate to uh, traditionally understood uh, long-term use of health and social care. I'd go a step further than our first speaker and emphasize that not only can there be partnership, but with a very wide range of people, there can also be user-controlled research, which I think is very, very important and helpful. I just want to say something about my understanding, coming from another standpoint, as a mental health service user, of, of what I've come to understand as, as, as neurodiversity and the neurodiversity movement, and just to quote, from um, something written by a guy who identifies as a member of that movement, Steve Graby. And, and what he says is that conditions such as autism, ADHD, etc., are real uh, to that movement and neurological in nature. They embody human diversity rather than representing pathology or deficiency. Thus, the movement seeks to celebrate neurodiversity and for it to be recognized and valued. So to accept there are differences rather than there is good and bad uh, okay and pathological. Now the key thing it seemed to me that report was doing, and we've been making the same journey or trying to make the same journey in other areas of, of using services like people as mental health service users, is to press for a shift away from a medical emphasis, a medical model, a medical approach, to more social approaches which are concerned with people's day-to-day -day lives. And that's what it means. It means moving from the dominating medical approach, which dominates still, I'd suggest, even in disability, certainly in mental health, and maybe in our domain here today. I, I think it's uh, something that um, is really exciting, this move, and it's coupled strongly with what people, uh, and I think people as uh, service users for short term, people on the receiving end of public policy in those kinds of areas, um, where there can be involvement which ranges from minimal and tokenistic, yes, to uh, in very serious, real, and controlling. Uh, but there's something else to remember, which is I think there are two very different agendas at work when there's discussion about user involvement. There is the prevailing uh, government-led agenda, which is consistent with the kind of neoliberal politics we've had the misfortune to experience 
since at least 1979, which is one which is managerialist consumerist in orientation. I, you're a customer now, don't all laugh at once. Not exactly a world of John Lewis, is it? And uh, you are a customer on the end of benefits, please, and uh, not to be conceived of as a client. The model of user involvement that comes from people as service users, disabled people and other movements, has been one which has been concerned with empowerment, control and democratization, which is to say that people are concerned with research and everything else being, con being geared to enabling people to have more say and control in their life and to make possible broader social change. But it's key, and we've already touched on it, you just touched on it, it's key from the work that we've done in shaping our lives that any such involvement, which I would argue for it to be meaningful, will need to be the second kind of involvement, and we draw that distinction, is inclusive and recognizes uh, in its fullest expressions diversity in how it's done. And I would recommend people check out a series of, of, of outputs that we produce from a Department of Health funded project called Beyond the Usual Suspects. There's a whole load of those, all can be got free from our website, and some are electronic resources. Because if we don't involve the wide range of people, if we only engage those seen as more able or facing fewer barriers, then we will only ever have a partial picture, and we will just, in another way, be perpetuating exclusions. So it must, it must be recognized that people seen as having less ability uh, and the rest are, are included in our efforts. And, and, and you just said it, but uh, what's seen as autism is understood as a communication disorder. Uh, by dominant models, and certainly communication uh, is critical uh, to enable, accessible communication is critical to enable uh, the meaningful and, and, and broad-based involvement of any group, including people from the neurodiversity spectrum. So that's another thing I really want to stress. Um, people can say that if you involve people, especially people with what are seen as less abilities, it will, be a lot, it will take longer. It will need more resources, it will be more complicated, and maybe it will need, and it should need, more innovative resources. But the brutal truth is it will come up with better things, better research, more appropriately and helpfully focused research, better support, uh, and better policy and practice. So I think there's a real answer there. Just a couple of last things I want to say. Um, this, is not, this is not something very difficult or complex. But we do need to learn from the experience that's out there and respect experiences, lived experiences that tend to be devalued, including those of the diverse range of people included in, 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 in the category of autism. So we've got to build on what we know. Uh, we have to be emphatically committed to every kind of access, physical access, communication access, cultural access. There has to be a commitment on the part of anybody doing this that they are serious and earnest in their efforts to evolve on equal terms. There has to be also, a, an, which raises some issues here, I realize, an interest in doing things together, <coughs> collective involvement, but it can work. And there has to be the building of alliances. And one of the things I'm pleased that we've been doing more recently in shaping our lives is build alliances with the neurodiversity community. And then there's a big issue here, the last thing I want to say. I have to say, from where I sit, this is a personal, not a scientific view, but to talk about involvement in two, with the government that we have and the politics we have is, if, if it's not taken very seriously and reconsidered, a little bit fatuous. Uh, because the involvement that most of us have is incredibly limited and increasingly being limited. We live in a time where democracy has been under serious attack, where we know that we have a government that's very opposite of representative, where we know that uh, issues of equality and poverty have been accelerating and how bad they've been getting. So one of the things that we have noticed, it came out in this study that we were funded to carry out by the Department of Health, is that people increasingly are recognizing that being involved might be about being involved from outside the tent and pissing in, rather than being involved in the tent and pissing out. And that means that people are campaigning and recognizing the need to be doing more assertive campaigning rather than being sucked into fatuous and futile consultations. It does not mean, of course, and we are a, a, a strategic partner in the Department of Health Participatory Initiative, checking and I said, it does not mean that you just say, no, I'm too pure to get involved in what government's offering, but that you are suspicious and wary, and it's not your only port of call. Because involvement is truly not only about trying to make change outside, it's about trying to make change inside all of us, 
so that we are more effectively able to, to make uh, the world a better place for all of us to live. And people are using different ways of working around uh, social networks and social media, which create some issues and problems in relation to any community, but also offer some new opportunities. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our final speaker, last but by no means least, is uh, Damien Milton. Uh, Damien is currently studying for a doctorate with the Autism Centre for Educational Research at the University of Birmingham. Uh, Damien's interest in autism began when his son was diagnosed in 2005 as autistic at the age of two. Uh, he was, and then Di Damien was also diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in 2009 at the age of 36. He's a member of the Programme Board for the Autism Education Trust and a member of uh, Research Autism Scientific and Advisory Committee. Damon has also started recently working with uh, the National Autistic Society as a consultant for their Ask Autism project. So over to you, Damon. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, so I'm going to be talking about what is meant by this term participation and inclusion and why it can be difficult to achieve as well. Um, I want to start with a quote that I heard at a disability conference earlier this year, which I believe came from a fictional author originally. Some of us aren't meant to belong. Some of us have to turn the world upside down and shake the hell out of it until we make our own place in it. Um, and this to me kind of sums up that participation and belonging, moving beyond that, is easier said than done to do well. Um, having an autonomous voice, though, is to me an essential requirement for individual well-being feel in control somewhat of your own destiny. For people on the autism spectrum, however, there can be a number of barriers to participation in wider social life. People on the spectrum have often been excluded from contributing towards the decisions that directly affect their own lives. This has led to many autistic-led advocacy groups to rally behind the slogan, nothing about us without us. There's various aspects, though, to what is meant by this social participation. Um, you could see it as acceptance and understanding, a sense of belonging, an engagement in public and political life, but being able to express oneself and, it, and affect change. And within this, there's individual and collective concerns participation as me, an individual person, but also us as a group. And there's a tension between present lived realities and what we'd like to see as a more collaborative future. Um, here's a table which has been used on this subject for many years that a woman called Sherry Einstein came up with in the late 60s. And it was called the, ladders, the Ladder of Citizen uh, Participation. At the bottom is no power or participation, um, characterized by manipulation and therapy. Which, uh, and in the middle were degrees of tokenism, vacation, consultation, and informing. If you look at those terms, manipulation, therapy, informing, consultation, vacation. It pretty much sums up how autistic people have been treated. Um, me and a sociologist earlier this year wrote a paper where my colleagues called it the glass subheading. So in research, you are not the author of the paper, you're quoted within it. Um, never in the certain sections of that paper, and so on. Um, although at the top of this ladder is degrees of citizen power, and I'll be going on to say some examples that are more at the top of this ladder rather than the bottom. Um, 
Um, so how to build a future shaped together is an easiest uh, thing to say than do. Um, one of the barriers here is the power and status within academia itself. Um, and what a colleague of mine, Larry Arnold, called the silo mentality. So you have psychology over here, neuroscience over there, autism, education here, critical disability studies, sociology. And all of these groups hardly ever talk to one another or get together and exchange ideas. And this is something I'm trying to break down on a personal level myself. Um, there's different expertise there and breakdowns in what can be called interactional expertise. So a scientist can often have next to zero understanding of sociology and vice versa at times. Um, this is particularly marked between autistic and non-autistic people. And what I call the double empathy problem is autistic people struggle to empathise and understand non-autistic people. But the same can be said to some extent, at least in reverse. So <coughs> to what extent um, people are really understanding the actions of autistic people? Um, can leave a lot to be desired. Uh, the other week I was reading in an internet thing uh, advice for job interviews where it was saying uh, maintain eye contact, don't fidget, uh, and all these things. And then it said people who didn't do this could be showing anything from an insecurity in their qualifications to outright lying. So it's interpreting autistic like behaviour is basically lying in job interviews. So um, this to me is an empathic with a different disposition whatsoever. So there's also problems with access to academia and decision making roles. To become a doctorate is doctor say, I'm still in the process of it myself. Um, I have a genius level <coughs> IQ, if you want to measure it, um, and I'm 40 years old and still doing my doctorate. So you could say that even for the highest functioning, excuse that horrid term, um, of us, getting access to academia is a very difficult process, let alone for someone like my son who um, largely non-verbal, so his voice is not there at all. Um, so there's systemic issues in a disabling society, and the framing of the autistic voice is another problem. Uh, people in the autistic <coughs> community have called it the self-narrating zoo exhibit, where you're put on show and your voice is framed for you. Um, from the outside, or you're the only autistic voice there, and you're only talking about your personal experience. Um, in some ways, this is uh, something to subvert somewhat, um, and to break down these barriers means building bridges between the various people and groups. So, examples of a better way forward. Well, how do we get beyond tokenism and precatory consultation? Um, well, we need team membership on re research teams and employment of autistic people. So their input is paid for. Um, we need, uh, there have been examples of working more in partnership my job for the National Autistic Society is in a project called Ask Autism, and it's looking to get autistic people work in training and consultancy and designing training about autism. Um, we're having a conference in late January next year on this very theme that we're talking about tonight, participation. But 
All the speakers will be people on the autism spectrum and hoping for about 20 people presenting. So, um, something a bit different in the field. And there's also working beyond participation and delegated power to what Peter was just saying earlier about um, citizen control. And there are events by and for autistic people and in the creation of what I called earlier this year, Bought Space. Um, a space, a cultural space which is being led by autistic people themselves. There's rights group by autistic rights group Highlands up in Scotland. There's also Altscape, a conference every year which is run by and for autistic people. Now, you could say, well, this space is being run by verbal, high-functioning individuals. Well, this photograph is a picture of me and my son at Altscape this year. My son would be classified as severely, classically autistic. Um, he had a rather happy time in a space which was designed more to meet his needs, which I think this photograph shows with the expression on his face. And there's some references, uh, and I can send that out to people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so we've got some time now for questions. Um, there are, there's lots of you in the room. I'm sure there's lots of questions that people have. Uh, what I would say is, if you could say when you're asked, could you put your hand up and ask? The, sorry, when you're chosen to, to give your question, just tell, tell us who, who you are and if you're from an organisation or where you're from. Um, can I also ask you to try and be as brief as possible simply because you know we want to make sure that as many people as possible get a chance to speak in the room. So who would like to ask a question? I'll be brave <laughs> Um, I'm very interested in um, ASD. Sorry, do you want to say who you are? Oh, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Is I'm, I'm just finishing my master's here in language and communication, which we're doing with speech therapists. Um, and part of the dissertation that I've come up with is actually working on Dragon software, which is an actual speaking Dragon software, and finding out whether that's going to enable ASD children to access the education system better through assessment. Do you think going on the title of the um, looking at the future and moving on, whether that is something that would actually improve people's lives if they were able, obviously with, with a voice, to speak to a computer rather than through LSAs? For people. <laughs> 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 some yeah. um, I think it depends on the person generally. Uh, Dragon software is a bit complex to use, so people may need support. I've used it myself, it can be quite useful for some wouldn't be too useful for people who are less verbal. Um, and also checking your the wording and that it makes a lot of mistakes, especially to begin with. Um, but having said that, through technology um, in various forms, I think has opened up uh, better communication pathways for a, a lot of people um, and things like iPads, the rest of it, and they're a lot more direct than something like a textbook as well, and a lot more fun. <laughs> so I think technology generally there is a lot of work to be done there in what helps people and for what kind of person. Okay. Does anybody want to add anything? 
Another question? I'm aware that several young people that I've worked with on the autism spectrum find it very hard, even if they're quite highly qualified, to get any kind of job. And I just wonder what your opinion is, or what's, I know there's prospects in the um, autistic society have kind of, like, all kinds of training and mock interviews and things, but I still think um, the kind of environment is, is sort of, is hostile and maybe becoming more hostile. I just wonder what you think about how easy or hard it is for young people on the autism spectrum to find paid employment or, you know, and, and for, their, for them to be respected within that and not expected to conform completely to the rules and uh, conventions of a workplace. I'll start on that one. <laughs> um, it's an absolute nightmare, to be honest. Um, Especially when I was undiagnosed as a young adult, my job prospects were virtually nil. Not because I didn't have intelligence or ability to work. I was turned down to a job at McDonald's in my 20s. You know, it was, uh, I had to work in factories to get, as a temp worker, to get work. Um, and which isn't exactly the most autistic friendly kind of work to do either. Um, and I would say this whole job market is systemically discriminatory against autistic people. Um, the way job interviews are designed, uh, the tick box kind of system they use, what they look out for. And you're in kind of on a hiding to nothing trying to train people up to act neurotypical, if you like, just to fail again and again and again at getting the job. What I found actually worked in getting work, other than talking about autism itself, uh, was in a sense things like work placements, uh, what Stephen Shaw, kind, uh, an autistic advocate, calls a portfolio approach to work. So you show people what you're capable of doing, um, and then they're more likely to take you on. Unfortunately, that often means working for nothing or in volunteer work. And often you get caught in a trap of being taken for granted in a sense and not being able to move up either. So one thing is sustaining work once you get it and then promotion as well. So it's not just getting the job, it's keeping it. Well, I, just two points I'd like to make. It, it, it is significant that we live in a, a society where work is um, conceptualized by those who have power, not as a right, but as an obligation. Um, and it, they obviously have a mindset. Perhaps they know more about how they think than they know about how we think. But most people are desperately trying to get out of doing anything. Um, and so if you don't force them into work, they will not want to work. But of course, the, the last 20 to 30 years have really been a time of thinking much more about the equal rights of different groups to be in employment. And what's shocking really, despite how much we know about what can support people to be in mainstream employment, is how untypical that is of people's experience. We do know a lot about how you can make it possible for many groups of people to uh, work um, to the best of their ability, which may not be a full-time job, but it, it, it certainly can be a contribution, which is a value to them and to the rest of society. And I, I think uh, if we're to challenge this increasingly arid conceptualization of employment, I mean, it's arid for those who have to do it. Clearly, it's not arid for those who get them as uh, very cheap uh, units of labor. Uh, and we know that's how the economy has been working in recent years. But it seems to me that there are, as it were, models of how it can be different. And although, in a sense, this looks like a, a very small scale uh, thing to be, to be talking about, I would uh, point to the value of user-led and disabled peoples-led organizations as organizations which the last government, for example, said it would support as a national network of local organizations, which hasn't happened. But still, this, some seem to be flourishing and are very innovative. And they are innovative both in how they work, 
how they employ people, who they are able to employ, how they can support people as workers, and in the services and goods that they can produce. Um, we do live in a bit of a world that's much more interested in the, the, the giant supermarket and the, the, the small corner shop, which is to, to the difficulty of such initiatives. But I was in Hampshire two weeks ago where there was a terrific event which was jointly organised by uh, disabled people, service users, mental health service users, etc., um, around what they call user-driven commissioning. And they also had commissioners present who were supportive, uh, trying to work out how they and their local authority could get much more humanistic and appropriate support for people through so an arrangement that was participatory where people as service users had an equal investment and involvement. And it was really positive and they've been making progress. So I, I see some hope for a longer term future. After all, I have to say, speaking personally, we surely cannot go on like this uh, in a society uh, in those kinds of, of, of um, innovative and hopeful initiatives. Um, well, so let me just sort of add one point to that, and again, I'm like, this is a sort of personal sort of view. But I think I think um, you know, I think people have been very aware for you know the past decade or more in the autism field, and for much longer in the um, neurodiversity, disability, mental health fields about these challenges. But I think sort of part of the solution actually has to be political because um, um, you know what it requires is things that are going to be there in the long term to be supportive over the coming sort of decades. Um, and, you know, um, that is in part going to be things that can be initiated by um, movements from the community themselves. But it is going to, you know, require joint working with commissioners, uh, employers, and uh, local and national politicians. So I sort of think, you know, one of the things is that um, it, it, it's a really important issue that we know is a, is a huge sort of challenge. You know, whatever progress is made in the short to medium term, it's not going to go away as a huge sort of issue. People need to make decisions about about um, the different ways in which you need to work, you know, in order to make that change. And I would personally say that some of that has to be political, and others can be things that can be done um, now, in the here and now, um, in the immediate community. It's, because it's going to be a challenge that's facing people across their lifetimes. <clears throat> any other questions or anybody any comments that anybody would like to make about what they've heard this evening? <clears throat> my, my, my angle on this is a grandparent. I have a couple of autistic grandchildren who are quite small. Um, um, but also I have um, professional experience of working in educational uh, here in this Institute of Education, Educational Research, and I'm aware, uh, this is totally old hat to all of you guys up there, but uh, I'm aware of the transitions that have occurred in educational research from researchers working on teachers to researchers working with teachers to researchers, God help us, working with teachers and students. Um, and sort of thinking of the parallels, maybe it's well that Cray is in this institute because it has that analogy to go with. But um, um, the particular uh, stage our family is at, so to speak, is with small children. And therefore, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent, um, probably there's a lot of this happening out there, uh, to what extent um, parents are being used, explored, uh, um, invited to join in. I mean, particularly if you have um, less formal concepts of research on the go, like biographical research and um, action research and so on, um, I would have thought they are, or could be, and probably are for all I know, a, a real treasure, as it were, in terms of um, research. But we know books like you know, the one you've written and other people have written are of great value to parents. Um, but to what extent could that be better organized or better communicated? Or are there parent networks to which it could be communicated? Are there publications uh, in which parents would as often as not be the authors, but also uh, the readers? Um, is this relevant? It's a question. 
Well, um, <clears throat> you know, if you, um, I think it's certainly relevant. I do a lot of work with very young children and have done for um, throughout my career, but also we do do studies with adults sort of now as well because some of the some of the young people who are adults in the studies we first saw when they were toddlers in our studies 20, more than 20 years ago. I, I mean, I think you're raising an important point in, in terms of um, lots of parents are extremely interested in taking part, and I get emails, not quite, but almost every day um, from parents asking me questions and asking what they can do. In terms of are there ways to turn that interest and offer into a resource, um, then could um, work jointly with uh, researchers of the community using a different number of methods as you sort of suggested. I'm not sure if, if that sort of resource quite in that way sort of exists. Um, I think that may be challenging because one, one issue would be sort of, you know, um, where that resource is hosted and how you, how you um, if people are interested, you know, Charlotte gave a good example of how you are interested and feel motivated to um, travel up to Cambridge and be involved in a piece of research, but it wasn't going to be a piece of research that happened to be um, uh, um, uh, 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 a happy one for her sons or probably from the team of Cambridge, which I know very well. So that was, you know, a waste of public money is a good way of sort of thinking about experiences like that. So, so even if there were some sort of, you know, electronic forum where people could express interest. In a sense, you need to be confident that, that, that the expectations on both sides are going to sort of work out. It's also true that if you're an academic running a research group or, or, or a centre, um, you, know, um, you have to think about how you spend your resources and um, the staff and students you have available you know, with you working on the questions that you're sort of working with. So they just, you know, I don't know how that would be mediated in terms of it being something that would be parents would find useful and helpful, and um, researchers and academics would find useful and helpful. I don't know of a forum sort of like that. Um, I don't know what other people think. Um, just one thing to say about uh, being a parent of, of uh, small, young autistic children, which thankfully I no longer am. Um, whatever willingness there is to take part in research, um, it, you know, you are just so busy and so knackered during those early years that it's actually the best will in the world um, that in itself is a big problem. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, with time, my sons, though by uh, still uh, autistic through and through, are much easier to handle now uh, that they're in their 20s. Um, but I remember actually, I was at uh, Supposed to be taking it with Sam, I think it was. Was he was supposed to be taking part in a, in a piece of research about self-stimulatory behaviours, stims, and I received this. I can't remember. I think it was guys, but I'm not sure. Some hospital, a London hospital. I received an enormous watch of um, sort of documentation, and I was supposed to observe Stan, Sam's stims, and I was supposed to record exactly how many times. Uh, he banged his hands on the window, or um, you know, spun round and round, whatever. And it, it was, it was sort of, is it between one and five, five and ten, ten and fifteen? You know, it was like that. And it was about, uh, you know, a, a huge range. Uh, so I was meant to be um, observing Sam, who I suppose was then probably about six, uh, who, you know, sort of twenty-four-seven, and um, at the same, you know, noting down in minute detail what he was doing, and at the same time preventing him from killing himself, which was my main role in those days uh, anyway. And you know, I just, you know, this can't be done. Um, so I think, um, not wishing to be negative about involvement of parents in research, but as I sort of said before about uh, getting the most out of my sons would be to come and observe them at home. Um, again, I mean, the most effective sort of research into that kind of subject would be um, the researcher coming to have a look rather than uh, relying on the parent to, to do it all. Could I, could I comment? Yeah. Could I, I comment first. And, uh, I mean, in a way, you're still thinking of the parent, so to speak, as the subject of research rather than as a co-researcher when, when you respond like that. Yes, and I true. understand why you would respond to that, because you were talking about research that starts off in a psychology lab or a sociology lab, so to speak. 
Um, but in education generally, we have had for, what, 40 years, the idea of the teacher as a researcher. So how about the parent as a researcher? Um, and then what sort of network and support um, would, would be needed to get that going? So basically, you would be more drawing on parents' experience in the way that it was convenient for them to express it. Um, yeah, I mean, I believe uh, that the online communication between yes. parents is enormously important. I mean, yes. I, I'm not, I'm not really uh, involved in that myself, but but I, I believe that you know there's a huge amount of, um, uh, or, or, you know, the internet is a wonderful resource in that way. Okay. Does anyone more comment from uh, David and then they're opening out some questions? Um, yeah, just I think what Charlotte was just saying, there's some examples of some pretty poorly designed research by the sounds of it. Um, and uh, one thing which could be done is um, groups of people who advise on the design and dissemination of research, things like that. What the plans are what we're moving towards and some way of feeding into that on a regular basis what our priorities are, what we should be spending this money on. And review teams like like if say me and Charlotte read a research proposal like that, we'd just laugh at it straight away. So how it ever got passed through I'm not quite sure, but things like that. So Money isn't being wasted and it's being targeted better. Uh, it's got to be some room perhaps of an advisory council with consultations, that kind of thing, just to get a bit of review and critical review and feedback going on with <coughs> families and people on the spectrum. Thank you. I have a question over here. My, my name is um, Karen Hurst. I um, am part of a new um, organisation that's run by and for autistic people called Angel. And part of what we do is training about autism, inside the training. Um, and one of the groups that I'm trying to get interested is um, therapists, who Damien had on his little um, chart there as low down psychotherapists because a lot of people with autism end up with problems and go and see therapists who don't recognize autism and also psychologists and psychiatrists and I suppose my question is if we have all this research about the nature of autism um, if it's not disseminated to people who can use it to help people with autism um, it's not terribly useful and how do we how do we do that? How do we sort of design a flow that goes from the whole design of the actual experiment, which, as you know, Charlotte was saying, is often ridiculous, um, to something that even if it's not ridiculous and it is good, is actually then used? Um, because I just like to say that the, the um, you know I've talked to trainers of psychotherapists and their training organizations have very tight um, services which don't include autism and you know that just seems to me to be a ridiculous thing that I know it's tangential to research but is actually relevant to research. Can I answer that just very briefly and then I'm sure other people will, will join. Is, um, one of the things that Research Autism was set up to do is, is, is make that link between res the research community and the autism community and to take research, um, but also to, to A, disseminate it so that people are, are more aware of, of the research that's going on, um, but also to kind of uh, look at ways that, that we can achieve practical outcomes from the research because even with the best will in the world, if something is working in a laboratory, it doesn't mean it's going to you know, have real world application, and I think there's a there's a sort of bridging role that we were set up to, to make, and we have, still have a long way to go. Um, but I'd urge you to have a look at um, our website, researchautism.net, um, because it does provide, or start, it's starting to try and provide some of the kind of information well, that you're talking I don't, see, about. To be honest, I have seen your website, yeah. and there's some things, like there's specific interventions, yeah. which you say are bad, and 
that I think is a problem as well because yeah. I know some people who benefited from those. Sure. So because people with autism are so varied, yes. the way in which research is done, which is to aggregate results um, and then make a decision about whether a, a procedure is useful, that can actually work against individuals with autism. Yeah. You know, so I, I mean, I know it's why, but... It is, and I think that the one of the things um, that we would say is that, you know, it is a spectrum, but we would look at what the evidence is, and there is sometimes not enough evidence in some areas, so we would want to see more research happening in one particular intervention. Can I just start on yeah. that with, um, with the research autism side, with the tip system and things is on the strength of evidence, and something could be good, there's just not any evidence to strongly suggest it yet. So I think I've been involved with them recently as well. So it's, um, and they have been adding in sort of more written text of contraindications, uh, um, more anecdotal things, qualitative reports. So it's not to say the evidence is there, but to have more information on each of the interventions, if you like. Although, I guess some people will just look at the tick system and that's it, kind of thing. I think they are improving the way they're doing the information. Uh, just two quick comments, Tony, and then you can say. So I, was, I was just going to say that you're raising some sort of broad issues and just two sort of responses to that is, you know, um, you know, I'm, you know um, um, there are lots of things that we don't properly understand about sort of autism, but there's an awful lot that we do understand quite well. And I think it's, you know, um, when you hear someone commenting that dissemination down to groups of professionals, such as psychotherapists or psychologists, you know, is not you know, um, uh, um, uh, um, is not done well, then that's, you know, that is sort of disappointing because we need to take advantage of the things that we, the knowledge that we do, the knowledge and understanding that we do have. Um, um, and, you know, I can say is that there are things, so in the, um, in the, in the set of suite of three nice guidelines that have come out in the past two, two years, there are some very clear, rather general paragraphs talking about the fact that professionals working with individuals with autism should have knowledge and training. And you just need to use those sorts of things to make sure the services and professional groups live up to those. So I just moved back to the Institute of Psychiatry after 25 years, and they run a clinical psychology training program. And they thought, oh, well, Tony Tarman's a right here, he can teach on autism. So clinical psychologists get half a day in their trainings, but obviously they may work in a service where they, uh, where they see individuals with autism. But in terms of the syllabus and the curriculum, it's half a day to decide uh, in a three-year training course. I just wanted very briefly to say that we shouldn't underestimate, by, while not being off-put by it, the, the, the scale of the challenge. It's, it's what's come from this report. What the report is talking about is the need for a sea change in research agendas. And it's talking about moving from the dominance of the medical to the more social approaches, which people on the receiving end invariably highlight as being helpful, whether they are family members, are people supportive, or people with direct experience, which are needed. But we must remind ourselves that there are very powerful alliances operating here. Uh, there are powerful alliances in the mental health context, about which I can speak with more confidence, which I expect may be replicated to some extent here, between a horrendously powerful pharmaceutical industry and medical dominance in terms of the way that doctors are unequally powerful in our society. And that coinciding with a society uh, where, for example, Michael Gove has lately been coming out very, very clearly saying that there is a serious problem of social workers who are over-indoctrinated with leftist ideology and who fail to understand the problems within people. Well, politicians and policy like that doesn't really want to hear social approaches. And I think that we really must, to deal with the difficulties that have just been identified, we must be concerted in the way we try to build alliances. Um, because the truth is that those who hold power now have a much greater access to the people we need to influence than some of these different viewpoints that we may be trying to advance will have. So it is a struggle. It's a struggle that's worthwhile. 
uh, and we should be optimistic, but it is a time of massive change and not a good time for such change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, thank Caroline for her question on um, psychotherapists, and they are by no means alone in not knowing about the autism. Um, what I, I think is really the issue here is not just that so many professionals have inadequate training on autism, but then those professionals go on to write case studies which become research which is misinformed, and we need to join the circle here. It isn't enough to say, oh look, there isn't enough going on with research in autism, and we've got some knowledge, but we haven't passed it to the right people. The people without knowledge are then producing results which feed into the system, and it's misinformation. All those psychologists that haven't spotted autism are writing up faulty case studies because they haven't seen what's in front of them. Um, we're producing rubbish research, which then goes on to produce more rubbish results. Um, some ways it's very common. Uh, <laughs> largely agree with. Uh, I think quality in research is very variable, and there's a lot of antagonisms as well in what I would say. Uh, philosophical or ideological differences throughout academia which is kind of hidden through public view most of the time or it's not explained. Um, what Peter was saying about this kind of medical model dominance is very much there in the autism field um, and building bridges rather than attacking one another within the field is important. What I was saying earlier about a language where a sociologist, a scientist, a parent, the person on the spectrum can all understand one another is a kind of mission impossible, but it's what we ought to be aiming for. Uh, There's a question there. Uh, thank you. My name is Linda Redford. And first of all, I'd like to say think this is terrific, but you've set down three recommendations which are actually three enormous challenges to the research community and those who fund the research community. Uh, for example, as has just been said, the shift away from medical foc medically focused research to looking more into interventions and other matters that are of more interest for those within the autism community. So my question is quite simple but very difficult. Um, what, are, what, what is the research community going to do to try and make these three recommendations a reality? So I do, do just respond, uh, respond directly to Linda's um, um, uh, critique. So, so um, I think that I think the audience for um, the, um, the report's conclusions um, um, about the challenges and the need to find ways ahead is primarily not actually. The, I, I think it's more than just the academic community. I think I think a lot of the report is 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 um, um, is also um, directed towards. Um, um, those who hold the power and those who control the money and those who run the system, which is very medically dominated, as everyone has, uh, on the panel has agreed, um, to, um, um, to use in the, um, uh, the way in which they um, try and lobby and influence the powers that be. And I think there are some good examples of this, as Peter will know much better than I will, in terms of um, um, uh, other areas of mental health and disability. I think it's just sort of that those arguments need to be put towards those who have the influence and, and ultimately the power. Um, so I think um, academics and researchers need to be part of that, but I think they won't be doing it alone. I think that hopefully it would be done in partnership as a community. And quite what that means in terms of activities and quite what um, the targets are and uh, quite um, how you judge whether you're performing well against those over the short to medium term, you know, it wouldn't be my place to say. I, I think you're right to, to highlight it's not just researchers we need to be looking at, it's, it's, it's people who fund research 
it's, it's people who buy research, and it, it is also researchers, and we can't necessarily expect a lot of understanding from government at some levels. I mean, don't forget, government has said, and, and Sally Davis, when I was sitting on the, whatever it was called, advisory group for National, uh, National um, Institute of Health Research, which she would come on uh, uh, having a lead role, um, she was supporting user involvement in research in a, a determined and enthusiastic way. There are levers, there are allies. We must remember that. Uh, it, it may not feel very real sometimes, and it can feel not very real at all, because I remember under Gordon Brown, who did keep the money going for research, that the, the kinds of things that we were hearing about at a high level were, we mustn't frighten the horses. If we're, if we're naughty to these big pharmaceuticals, they'll all go away and set up shop in other countries. Well, they, they didn't at that time, but it was interesting to read very recently that pharmaceuticals are now funding less research in the UK, and that's even though we've absolutely done everything as a, a government that they've asked us to do uh, in freeing them up. So, you know, there are real problems and tensions here. I would say that the research community is not one community. There are a number of communities, and there is this division uh, between those people who believe the, the fantasy of men in white coats doing scientific research. We're still stuck with some elements of Victorian folklore here. Um, uh, endlessly futile stuff, me too stuff in the pharmaceutical trade with, uh, and I guess the same happens uh, for, for mental health problems, but the same happens in, in, in the context today. But at the same time, it's important to notice that people come and people go as researchers. And when I look at young and newer researchers, when I see particularly women researchers, people as, for example, disabled researchers and survivor researchers, uh, BME researchers, etc., 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 these are people who come at this in different ways. There is a struggle going on. We must remember that. This is a time of radical change. We wouldn't be having this conversation 20 years ago, possibly not 10. And that's why we should be excited and optimistic. But it's a struggle. And these are not good social or political times for it. But I think that because what we can promise are several powerful things. One, when people as service users, whatever we call them, ourselves, are involved, there is an engine for change. It's never just a put it on the shelf. Um, I'm, I'm happy as someone who is involved in research projects from a service user organization to employ ordinary mainstream researchers who know their job but will be accountable to us. So there's lots of good people out there, but we don't necessarily want them telling us what the agenda should be, nor do we necessarily want governments telling us. We've got to do a lot of hard work raising our profile, raising also these issues in the big charities, who I think sadly sometimes can be a, a vehicle for slowing progress down uh, rather than for advancing it. And we should be more supportive of those small user-led and local and community-based and BME organizations uh, and, and build links, because I do feel positive about this. This is a good time in lots of ways, but I'm afraid the responsibility is going to lie with people like us. Um, we have time, <coughs> excuse me, probably just for, for one more question, um, oh, or maybe two then. So one there, I'm um, fine one there. So, Hello, my name is Louise and I am um, um, I, uh, <coughs> in between a practitioner for, with um, individuals with autism. Um, and you've kind of taken the wind out of my sails because my question was sort of framed around some of the things that you've just been saying. And that is that um, Tony was, uh, in summary of, of uh, this piece of research, was just saying that there's a very clear need for more research into intervention. Um, and for me as a practitioner, uh, intervention is all around um, helping people develop um, people's individual capacity to participate. Um, but I find it incredibly frustrating that a lot of the research, even the intervention research that exists, is extremely polarized. Um, so the kind of the, the divide we've been talking about in terms of the medical model versus the educational model and so on actually exists also in terms of intervention research and what constitutes um, evidence and what constitutes best practice. And I, so my, my question is, is the, I'm, is the time 
does the panel feel that the time is right for um, those of us who are involved in intervention research to come together and instead of having that polarization of debate to find common ground and to start to build on that so that we can actually take things forward um, to improve so, so, I mean, my main response to that would be that's um, fantastic for someone to put forward as a generous offer of how to start an initiative um, at the event this evening. And I didn't, wasn't expecting people to put their hand up and volunteer, but I think those you know, initiatives like that sound extremely sensible. I agree. I've also been involved in intervention research of a particular type in autism. I'm um, coming from a particular you know, um, uh, set of sort of models and practices, and research practices and intervention practices. You know. The, you know there's more than one kid on the block. You know, I do think that sort of um, um, dialogue um, uh, between and amongst, you know, for instance, people involved in um, running services and delivering intervention, and those who are in receipt of that intervention, you know, is is um, hopefully going to be a good thing. So we do need initiatives like the one you're suggesting. Well, I would happily talk to you about this afterwards and take it and help to take it forward. Thank you. So, quick response to that. Um, I think there is a need for people to come together like this uh, to have more debate around issues and uh, from across disciplines and across areas as well uh, on these issues. I think the idea though we can collaborate and work together but we're not always going to agree. Um, as you all know. <laughs> and uh, I think that's not a bad thing though in itself. Uh, collaboration doesn't necessarily mean consensus or agreement, but the sharing of ideas and debating, well, it should improve everyone in a sense. Uh, Thank you. Um, we have a final question for the evening here. Um, hi, I'm Louise. Um, I work in a special needs school and um, support children with autism. Um, there's something that was mentioned earlier which I really identified with, and that's about um, children with, or young people with uh, very complex needs, so non verbal, um, often very challenging behaviour, and how they're very much um, sort of underrepresented in, in research. So, I guess um, my question is do you know of current projects or research which are uh, and sort of geared towards giving these individuals a voice, so individuals who have more barriers and um, and certainly in my mind are more vulnerable um, because if we're talking about being involved in decision making and shaping our own lives, how do we help those people to make make decisions? Thank you. Very good question to end on. I know some work where I'm at that was done in the past at the Uni of Birmingham. There was a woman called Anne Lewis who was looking into mm -hmm. things like that. Um, although it's always going to be um, a problematic thing um, because what was said earlier about you have to do things like observational studies. It's like my son, as an example, would not be able to take part in most research, so the only way would be to observe it. But then, who's doing the observing? Who's doing the interpretation of that? How is that being done? Who's that involved? And there's ways we could certainly improve on that kind of thing. And working together on it. I mean, I would just add to that, but this is from the context of people identified as having learning difficulties and having uh, the, the kinds of issues associated with them that you highlighted, not least not, not communicating verbally. That the, the thing I have learned that is if, if you want to have any useful role, and I think here's where, where research melts into other things too, then there has to be the development of relationship. Um, you, you know, I had this conversation with a friend of mine many years ago um, and asking her how best we could find out what such people felt about changes in the services they were receiving and she said, you will have to form a relationship with them to be able to find out. I've always stuck with the simple adage that everybody can have some contribution to make to express their view about what they want for themselves but it's the responsibility of others to make it possible for that to be realized. <coughs> Not that there are some who can't. That's always been the adage. 
So I think you have to have a relationship, and then that means that you have to be even more brave in challenging all the old assumptions of research, which don't stand up well, but which still have a kind of, a, a, maybe it's a, a male neatness about them that means that people sort of love them. Uh, takes us back to the Victorian white coats, which is that they should be without bias, distanced, neutral, and objective. There ain't no such thing between human beings, and any research that purports to be so is, is not really getting it quite right there are porkies about. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to admit that this is relational, and that we will have to find out with those people, and the people who know them well, how we can get as much as is possible for them to be part of the some partnership, some sort of partnership. Thank you. Um, oh, Charlotte. <laughs> well, just it's not really an answer to your question, but just uh, sort of uh, to sum up. Um, I was I actually did my teacher training qualification here at the Institute of Education in uh, 1981, and it just suddenly struck me that when I did that, autism wasn't mentioned at all. Um, and I would just like to say on a sort of positive note how incredibly good it is that these kinds of discussions now take place and we're, we're, we're not perfect, there's an awful lot of work to do, but the whole concept of uh, giving autistic people a voice in, in what happens to them, I don't think that concept existed in 1981. Thank you. That's a, very, that's a very good one of ending the, the evening. Thank you all for your participation and contributions. Um, can I ask you to join me in thanking the panel? <laughs>